presentation. My name is Elizabeth Romero. I serve as Assistant Vice Chancellor of Governmental and Community Relations at UC Riverside. Um, I'm also a fellow elected Latina in local office. I serve on the Riverside County Board of Education. Um, I think I'm one of the longest serving here. So I've been elected for close to 20 years. Um, and it's uh, been a great pleasure to get to know these amazing leaders on this panel. But before we get started, um, I think we couldn't have a Latina panel without acknowledging um, what's been happening in California, what's been happening in greater Los Angeles. Um, so I think it's really important for us um, as leaders to ensure that we confront the issues that are impacting our communities. We can't ignore the deeply disappointing display of racism and hateful rhetoric uh, that was espoused by uh, Los Angeles elected officials and community leaders, many of whom we've supported, we've looked up to, um, and we've trusted. In a council whose membership is filled with historic firsts, their actions of blatant prejudice have placed a dark cloud over the progress that we've made as a Latinx community. And it's not something that we can simply sit back and ignore. This, play, this type of behavior should not take place in our society. And it's very difficult when you pin one disenfranchised community um, and who's often traumatized against one another. And we won't stand for that. Also, we can't sit back and think that this is just a teachable moment. This needs to be an actionable moment and it needs to be a wake up call to many people, um, including our own leaders. And so many of us who are sitting on this stage have also taken a solidarity pledge. Um, and so I encourage any of you um, who haven't uh, seen it, many of us have posted it on our social media and it reads, as elected Latinx Hispanic leaders, we acknowledge and condemn the pervasive existence of racism and colorism in our community, denounce anti-Indigenous sentiments, affirm that Black Lives Matter, and pledge to recognize our own relationship to power and privilege, and commit to the lifelong work that comes with unpacking our own biases. Take action against such racist behavior and attitudes regardless of whether we encounter them in public or private, and disrupt patterns of white supremacy and oppression by working in solidarity with Black, Indigenous, and all marginalized communities to build a better future where power is shared rather than hoarded, and we see our liberation as bound together. So. Thank you. And, and I know this is a very difficult um, you know, conversation and, and one that we need to continue to unpack as a community. But um, now putting that, you know, not aside, but just putting it away for a minute. Um, I do want to have uh, our amazing panel um, share a little bit about who they are. But first, I'll start just doing a brief introduction so you know who's in the, in the uh, panel. We have Palm Springs Mayor Pro Tem, Grace Gardner. And I'm gonna ask each of them to actually do their life story in a minute. So we also have the Honorable Clarissa Cervantes, the Riverside City Council member, and the Honorable Jackie Casillas, Corona City Council member. And so I have a, a series of questions. Um, so rapid fire. Give us your life story in one minute. I am Grace Garner. I'm a second generation Palm Springs resident, a Latina, an attorney, uh, a renter. And part of the reason that I ended up running for city council is because of all of those different identities and wanting to make sure that voice was heard in Palm Springs. And this is something that I've been wanting to do for a long time. When I was eight years old, I asked my mom what I could do to make the world a better place. And being the feminist that she is, she said, you can be the president. And I said, that's a fantastic idea, mom. <laughs> I, I said, what do I need to do? And she told me that I should be an attorney. And so I said, okay. And truly every single step that I've taken that's led me to this moment has been because 
my mother told me at eight years old that I could be the president and I believed her and I still believe her. So that's what led me. That's what, what has led me here. And I think that's, that's grace in a nutshell. <laughs> well, for myself, I am a first generation Mexican American, very proud uh, to be here today with these incredible leaders and to have witnessed and heard some individuals before. Thank you to everyone who's attended. For myself, I grew up in Coachella Valley, and for me, at the age of eight, I actually started. I started knock, knock, door knocking, knocking on doors <laughs> with my parents. Uh, my father was an elected official; uh, he served as a council member and a mayor when we were younger. And my mother was a school educator. I think for myself, how I know that my life became paved to public service was every summer my mother would ask me to pick a civil rights leader and say, "Who do you want to study this summer?" And then she would take me to the library and I would pull books on Rosa Parks, on Cesar Chavez, on Martin Luther King Jr. And those people became my idols. They became my reason to want to do more work. And I actually used to look at her and I used to say, Mom, I missed it. I missed it. I was supposed to be there. And she'd be like, no, Mia, you didn't miss it. It's okay. And I was like, I missed it. And being here today now, I didn't miss anything. Um, I've come to find and found that we are all needed here right now in this time. And the progress that we have made is being challenged and has been challenged to deep levels. And so I know for a fact that I am here to make a difference. I'm here to help people believe that they belong in this world and to assure that equity, balance, justice, and fairness are truly the core pieces that keep government and people alive and thrive. That was, exactly. That was it. That was wonderful. And you want to know pressure, it's, uh, hey, tell me your life in one minute. Uh, my life is very much like that first generation, uh, as, you know, a story, right? I'm here because of the hard work and ethic of my parents, my, my ancestors, um, I was born and raised in the city of Corona, a city I now get the pleasure to serve on council. Um, and I look forward to diving in deeper into the future questions and getting to know you all. But I welcome uh, connecting with you afterwards and getting to know you more personally. Okay, I won't, I won't do an elected official minute. But um, what is um, what inspired you to run for office? We'll start with Jack. Um, representation, but on many levels, not just not seeing anyone on my city council that was Latino, but also not seeing many women in, rep in local office, not seeing anyone younger than the age of 50 in representation, not seeing anyone who had not been in council for less than 12 years. And so I or help uh, lead a ballot initiative with other, uh, you know, Corona residents to change the way that we elected our city council so that they had to be elected by district rather than at large, because at the time, four out of the five lived within a five mile radius of one another and made it to city council through the same power structure. So that really shook things up. Since then, in 18, my husband said, you know, I was like, so who's going to run? And of course, you look around and the exact same people run. And my husband looks at me and he's like, are you kidding me? He didn't work that hard to then have the same people say that they should be at the table. You need to run. You need to, you need to get in there. And um, I'm happy to say that we have an entirely new council, a lot of momentum. We're doing great work in the city of Corona. And I hope to share a little bit more about that. Well, for myself, I can remember very clearly when I, I had a, the honor and privilege of being able to serve the War II community as the legislative field representative for three years. And then the time came at the end of 2020 when a former council member, Andy Melendres, decided to retire after 16 years of representing War II. And the question came, who's going to run? I received multiple phone calls and there was that moment where I thought to myself, I don't know. I don't know. I like being behind the scenes. And I'm saying this, a lot of people who do this work usually say that. And I ended up going on a healing journey just a week later. And it was in Mexico. And I will never forget, I was in a yoga session 
uh, doing the meditation when the instructor said, I don't know who needs to hear this today, and looked right at me and said, you are no longer allowed to play small. I remember feeling like a ton of bricks hit me. <laughs> and I was like, she's talking to me. There's 50 people in here, but she's talking to me. And I remember I got up and I walked outside and I called my big sister, assembly member Sabrina Cervantes, and I said, I'm going to run to represent board two of the Speaker for Sign. And, and uh, when I came back home and announced, I remember what further instilled for me to know that it was the right thing to run. It was my community. It was just taking a drive into the district that I have been into countless of times, lived, knocked on doors, spoken to people, and just to know that those people's stories, that their lives, they deserve someone who cares about them and loves them and will represent them the right way that they deserve to be represented. And I knew in my heart I could be that person. Yeah, similar to Jackie, I helped with the redistricting in Palm Springs. And the city of Palm Springs was sued because of, of racially polarized voting. And I got involved with the, the districting commission because I started going to the meetings and just saying what I thought about how the district should be laid out. And the committee said, hey, Grace, we see you keep coming over and over again to these meetings. You should join our team. And so I started working with them doing uh, Spanish language outreach and really targeting the Latino community to make sure that their voices were heard. We set up meetings at elementary schools. We did everything bilingual. Uh, we made sure that we brought food as well. And we had a lot of success. And we had more you know, Latino engagement than we'd had in Palm Springs maybe ever. And that was because myself and my family knew the community. We were the community. So we were able to bring those voices in. And so when it came time to actually run for the seat, uh, there were three white men that decided they wanted to run. And so I was looking around and I was asking people, come on, we just made this district. It's majority people of color. Come on, who's going to run? Who's going to run? Uh, and there wasn't anybody except these three white guys. So I did. I ran <laughs> because somebody needed to be a voice for the people and not just there for ego or for power. Yeah. So once you get on council, once you, you know, you've, you've done the hard work of, of getting elected, um, being an elected and governing is something that's very different. That create, that requires consensus. It requires relationships, especially if you're working to push, um, a specific issue. Um, so share with the, the, the group, um, here, what has been the most, um, the, the most important um, policy that you've advanced that you're proud of? Right when I'm thinking about five policies in my head, I could stay here all night, but I won't do that to you. I'm going to speak of one policy, though, and I think it's important to talk about the ones that we haven't been able to be successful in yet. And so I'm an, sorry, I'm an artist. I'm a muralist. Um, I think it's a little unconventional sometimes for people to hear of an elected official who is an artist in the community, but that is my one of my professions I'm very proud of, and I've known being in that space, having been a working artist and understanding the challenges that artists go, go through um, when we're discussing the budgeting. To have a mural go in a community, just so that people know on average, is $15,000. However, artists are constantly expected to put something up for $1,000. <laughs> So for myself, I felt being in the city of arts and innovation, I wanted to create an, the first ever artist in residency pilot program that would allow for artists to actually have a budget and to be paid appropriately. And what that would have done at the end of a two year pilot, it would have allowed for seven murals, new community murals that were rooted in storytelling of the neighborhoods to be installed throughout the city of Riverside. We fell short one vote when I took this to the Arts Council for Critical Unfunded Needs. One vote for $75,000 that would have funded a two-year pilot program that would have transformed the lives of three artists in our community, but we're not done, and I'm gonna bring it back. <laughs> and so I, that was one for me that I was so proud and passionate about. We had so many comments and letters come in from residents from the East at Art House, um, up and down the community. But one I wanna say that I'm proud of that did pass, and I don't know if it would have passed if I hadn't been here, but it was the street vendor ordinance. And for us to be able to pass and update our street vendor 
ordinance policy that allows for street vendors in our community to have the right to work and to do their business as we know they want to do. Um, that to me, I was so proud to share the stories of growing up in Coachella, picking oranges with our family, with our grandparents and selling them on the side of the road. And we need to honor and understand that these are, this is how people earn their living. So thank you. So it's interesting because you really are asked to pack so much into, into a two minute answer, but I'll tell you, I mean, I'm, well, <laughs> I'll tell you, I'm proud of the fact that we passed um, term limits. That's something I ran on. I'm proud of the fact that, you know, we have opened up city hall to students and our student discovery day. But the thing that I'm most proud of and to speak to Elizabeth's point about governance is that I've learned to use the system and the rules to institute the changes I want to see in my city. I played and, and played the long game, strategic plan. People like fall asleep during a strategic plan, right? But I fought hard for us to call out our sixth goal as creating a sense of place in the city of Corona. And under that umbrella, we now have funding for things like reinvestment in our parks. We've got new park infrastructure. We acquired 292 acres along the Cleveland National Forest that will now be perpetually preserved. We are you know, forming real, um, uh, we have trails master plans and creating a trail master inventory to create the city of trails in the city of Corona. If you've never hiked there, please come join us. Um, we have also you know, just reopened with the help of Assemblymember Cervantes, secured more funding for reopening Griffin Park, which was closed for 13 years. And that is now our second dog park in the city. And so when we talk about governance, right, a lot of times, yes, there are these big votes, but, but most of the time, it's, it's making sure that the rules, that you're in there and you're not falling asleep at the wheel, and you're changing the rules, you're changing the plan, because this is long-term strategy. Not only do you need to identify the vision, but you need funding. So by getting it in our strategic plan, I've been able to create an umbrella to create a sense of place that has changed our, our community. And you can see it now also in our, um, the investments and in our communications. Our communications are finally showing images of our actual residents. We're not using stock pictures. You know, we have finally, we created a um, community conversations, which was really beautiful. And for his, uh, Latinx Heritage Month, we had a, um, a community conversation uh, full of just our local leaders. And so it's just really dynamic things that are happening. And, and really it's because of that governance piece of, of making sure that we're instituting it in the rules, in the game plan, in the long-term vision of the city of Corona. So I'm really proud of that. I just told our media people that I don't want any more stock images. <laughs> so I totally get that. Uh, so, so for me, it was really tough to become a council member. I was, uh, I was sworn in in December of 2019, and three months later, I they're making critical decisions for the health of my residents. I mean, that was a huge shift when I was barely figuring out how to even do this role. Uh, and one of the things that I was told early on by a colleague was, uh, if you want something to pass or to get on the agenda, then you really need to just get at least one other council member to kind of fight for it and just lobby the city manager and just push and push and push until it gets on the agenda. And I was working full-time as an attorney and working full-time really as a council member. And that just wasn't working for me, needing to lobby the city manager, needing to try to figure out who was going to be on my side on, on an issue that they cared about. I didn't make sense to me. So one of the things that I did was one push for strategic plan. And when we got a new city manager, that was one of the first things we did. And then at that strategic planning, I said, okay, things need to change here. If, we, if you want something on the agenda, you need to talk about it on the dais, in public, and you need to have a majority of the council agree to put it on the agenda. This is the people's business. This is, it is unfair for, the, for our residents, and it's unfair to us as council members to just all of a sudden see something on the agenda when we had no idea that it was even being discussed. 
And I was really nervous about it. I thought this is just the way it's been for years, for decades even, you know, is anyone even going to support it? But the council unanimously said, yeah, you're right. And it's been a little bit of a learning curve as we figure it all out, but it's working. And now when the agenda is coming in front of us, all five of us know what's going to be on it and we know how it got there. And that has made such a big difference in being able to connect with my colleagues and to be able to feel good about what I'm discussing uh, and doing for the people of Palm Springs. Thank you. We know that these jobs are um, an incredible honor, um, being able to impact change, to do um, positive things for your community, but they can also be quite difficult. And, you know, there's tough votes, there's the inter interpersonal things that happen um, among council with the public, some of the, you know, long nights that folks don't get to see. How have you built confidence and resiliency um, in your political career uh, as you're navigating it, especially as a Latino? That's a, that's a tough question. I, I think the most important thing has been surrounding myself with people who care about me and love me and are honest with me. And I, you really need to make sure when you're in any kind of position like this, especially as an elected, that you have a group of people that, that really care about you and are, and are willing to tell you when you're wrong and are also going to shake you when you're kind of spiraling out and thinking, what, what, this comment was taken out of context and you're crying over, you know, what's in the newspaper. They need to kind of give you a shake and say, hey, it's okay. You know, people are going to get over it. And if you really need to apologize, then just apologize. But sometimes you need those, those people to like look, really look you in the eye and tell you what it is that you need to hear. And so those are the people I've really come to count on over the last few years. And, and I'm grateful that so many of them are here in this room. Well, I think for myself, one of the things I felt that why I was prepared and ready to serve when I made that decision was because I had come to a place where I fully loved myself. And I fully had respect for myself. And I knew that my, I know my compass and I trust my intuition. And I think that's so critical for people to have when you're going to step into the space because ego has been mentioned. And if you have not killed that inner child, it is going to show on the diets. When you are upset, when decisions are not going the way you want them to go, you're not able to effectively communicate, it comes through in these, these moments, especially when things get controversial. But if you know yourself, if you are confident about what you're showing up, what you're speaking on, what you care about, who you're fighting for, you're unwavered. And I believe that's helped me to be confident when I've had to come and address some very serious issues, had to bring up some very uncomfortable topics. I've been personally, publicly attacked um, and have had myself be in the newspaper, which has been challenging. But I have a community that loves me. I have a family that loves me. I have a daughter who loves me. Who loves me. My sister is right here in the first row. And the, that is what keeps me in my heart grounded and allows for me to show up every day and to know that I can do this and I'm going to do this. <laughs> um, we have days where we wake up and I can share with you that um, there have been moments I felt paralyzed uh, in terms of if mentally, can I get up and do this? And I think it's important to be honest about that because we are people, we are humans. Days can be very hard. But again, I can close my eyes and all I have to immediately envision is what is my purpose? And I can get up out of bed because my purpose is right outside that door and it's Riverside. Okay, but Elizabeth, you were asking, you know, this is the confidence, right? What do you do to get that confidence? And I think my colleagues have said it really, really well. It's know your village, have your village around you, know yourself, and it's practice. I mean, sometimes you kind of have to fake it a little bit when you're not in there. And there's this probably not a great um, quote, but I'm going to say it. Like you have to have the confidence, like practice the confidence of a mediocre white dude. Like they have all the confidence in the world, like practice it. Right. And I have seen it in our, in our governance spaces. 
like there are colleagues who will unabashedly say things that you just sit back and you're like, you really said that out loud, right? Or you really think that's a good idea or you think you can get away with that. But yet we self-censor. We sit there and we think about and self-edit or we don't speak up or we don't say the thing that then afterwards you're like, yeah, that's what I was going to say or that's what I was thinking. And so sometimes it's practice and you just kind of fake it a little bit and you have to recognize that like, you're there for a reason. You know who you are. You have a village that supports you and loves you and elevates you. Like, do it. Carry that same confidence. Like, because they do and they shouldn't. So you should. Thank you. Thank you for, for your answers. Thank you for being you know, vulnerable, too. And that's important in this work. Um, so we have, a, I think, aspiring elected officials, people who are in, interested in getting more involved in the political process, what are the top three things that they should consider? So be specific, campaigns, you know, preparation, maybe that might be helpful as, as we have, you know, hopefully the next generation that will be sitting up on, on this panel. Great. All right. <laughs> I think you really need to start thinking about who your network is. So who is the person who is going to introduce you to the richest man in the room? Who's going to open that door for you? Or woman, or woman, sorry. I'm thinking of my people in Palm Springs. But, but yes, who's the, who's the richest person in the room and, who's, and who is the one that's connected and who's going to introduce you, right? Um, who is going to take care of you? This doesn't have to be a partner. It can be your mom. It can be your friend who always cooks too much chili, you know, whoever it is, but somebody to take care of you. And, and then you need uh, someone who's going to be honest with you and who's really going to keep it real. Uh, and you need to make sure that those three people know what their role is, right? You can't just be like, oh yeah, I, I oh, that's, you know, these three people and not tell them, right? You got to tell them like, hey, I want to run for office or I'm about to run for office. And I see this in all of you and I need your help. But you really need that money. You need someone who's going to be honest and you need that person who's going to take care of you. Uh, and everything else, it'll fall into place. You can figure it out, but those three are pretty critical. Well, the first one I'm going to be brutally honest and say that uh, echoes as well is uh, be prepared to be on the phone and calling and fundraising fundraising and one thing I want to also let people know that there is um, you're going to have to learn how to ask for a lot of money and get very comfortable doing it very fast and for myself I think I want to just share with folks if you're considering running or if you're running again for her office understand how abundant you are understand that abundance and money you it, you it is attracted to you. It chases you. It wants you to be in this seat so you could represent and do the work that you're meant to do. But if you don't believe it, it's not going to come. And so it's like attracting energy and vibrations and you have to really believe it's all coming to me. If, did you imagine my face when I was told you have to fundraise $100,000 to run for city council? Well, guess what? We fundraised $180,000. <laughs> And it wasn't easy, but the mo I didn't start off by telling myself, we're never going to hit this goal. I started off with saying, we're going to win this and we're going to, I'm going to figure out what it takes to get there. And I'm going to ask as many people as I can, meet, as I can, as many people as I need to multiple times. Um, so be relentless, be relentless and know that people want to help. They want to help to pay you, pay you to get where you want to go. Believe that. The other part I will echo as well is your community. Having, whether it be family, friends, extended people in your lives, um, some people you cross paths with and they are meant to be in your life. And maybe they're not a blood relative, but you are meant to have them. There are several people here in the room today. I'm going to make eye contact with a couple of you, but you are some of those people in my life who I know I'm supposed to look at you, look at you, <laughs> who I'm supposed to have because you all uplift me. So find the people who believe in your dreams. Find the people who, when you say, I'm running for state assembly, they say, yeah, you are. When is your first fundraiser? Find the people who are excited about the work and the passions that make you come alive. And that, to me, is what I feel has allowed for me 
to feel that I could do this. And I think it stops at one and two because it was money and it was believing. <laughs> and the third is just delivering. Deliver. Find it in yourself to be able to show up every day and get the people around you inspired to do the work with you. Because that saying, it takes a village, is true. But it feels so much sweeter when you win with everyone around you. <laughs> so it's sad that we will all say that money is necessary and running for office. Unfortunately, until we change the system, money is necessary. So top three, unfortunately. Um, but I will echo and say that um, aside from it being absolutely, unfortunately necessary for you running for office, the two other things that you need to critically know is yourself and your why. Like, why do you want to run for office? And do you know who you are? Because if you're not comfortable with who you are and that can be weaponized against you, I mean, you're done. You're toast. If I can take part of who you are and make you feel guilty or ashamed about it, you should not be running for office, right? So know who you are and know why you're running. What is it that is motivating you? What is it that you want to change? Why is it that you're stepping into this role? Um, those two things are critical. And unfortunately, the financial aspect until we all fix it and get public funded <laughs> campaigns with some actual limits um, and not, you know, you know, packs or people, um, it's going to be an element that you're going to have to get comfortable with. If you're curious at all about potentially running for office, volunteer for a candidate now. You will learn so much, so much from your hands-on experience at a grassroots level. And that candidate will be eternally grateful for your enthusiasm and your support. And there are some on this stage who are currently running for office. So it's a good opportunity. I said it, they didn't. Um, but I would also add, uh, there are several training programs out there that train especially young people to run for office. So um, young people for um, talk to other folks that have gone through this process. There's, like I said, plenty of training programs online um, that are good, just places to start unpacking what's going to be needed, what's a campaign look like. But I would, I would echo volunteering is definitely um, the way to get some practical, practical experience. Um, so let's see, hold on. I'm checking my time because I don't want to make Denise mad. Um, channeling my favorite podcast or one of my favorite podcasts, um, Tamarindo Podcast. Um, how do you find your calma? And um, how is it that you stay grounded and take care of yourself? I'll start with, I think this is a good <laughs> Thank you. Well, for myself, I start my day with saging <laughs> and I end with it. And I'm not lying. <laughs> so um, medicine, the medicina, uh, in my cultura, my culture, uh, Palo Santo and uh, sage medicine is beautiful and is really a great way to be able to clear the air, clear your spirit um, for myself. And that is something that I have found to be a very healthy way to be able to just feel like coming back to center of breath. A lot of people don't realize this, but we all have a lot of breath work we have to do. <laughs> do any, is anyone here holding their breath? Not just me? No. <laughs> so I actually have come to find that my breath, being able to be in contact and literally connected to my breath, you would be surprised when moments are happening, especially moments when you're again making big decisions and people's lives are on the line or you know, there's an impact that can happen in some way for me to be able to, and I've had to actually, there's been a few times that I've had to sometimes one time get up and walk away, go to the restroom, take a breath and come back. And that breath has allowed me to just come back to my center. And so I think for myself, how I stay grounded is by one, connecting with my breathing, healing myself with my the sage and the medicines that I've had for my culture, but as well as, Talking with people and those friends, family that you can trust, um, or even whether it be a therapist or somebody else that you feel confidently you could communicate with, but 
being able to talk with people about what you're feeling and what you're going through, especially being in a position like this, is so important. But I've come to learn it's so important. And so I really encourage people, if you feel that you com comfortably can speak to someone, please do seek out that friend, that companion, that help. Because talking is one of the most powerful ways that you can get so much off your heart. And really then, how we show up, what we carry has an impact on the world. So if we have all these things that are heavy weight in us, it's going to impact the work, what you're doing. So I have to find ways and uh, actually water's one, taking a swim or going for a dive, but cleansing everything again to shake it off. But those are ways that I find myself physically, how I try to come back to my home, my center, myself. You know, right? I'm like, I find myself breathing as you're saying, like, like breathe. I was like, yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. Um, <laughs> let's all take a break. In fact, it's so interesting. Anyway, side note, my sister just got married last weekend. Um, Sarah Doyle officiated. And she started the ceremony by having us all take a deep and meaningful breath. And I'm telling you, it was the best way to start a ceremony. So anyway, it was beautiful. And I highly recommend it. Um, how do I stay grounded in the same way that I, um, I feel before I was on council? It's it, the people that hold me down, my friends and my family. That's all, that, that's my rock. That's what I go to. So as busy as you get, like making the time to make the time, right? So like, if that means, um, when your friend calls you at nine o'clock when they're taking a walk in their neighborhood, right? Or another friend calls you when they're driving to like Las Vegas, right? Or when you have like a, like a chat squad text message or you really want to go to garden grove and get fun with your friend like you make the time because that's the stuff like they re-energize you like you're around your village you're around your people and you're like this is good this is i'm a normal person this is good this is so that for me that is it it's it's being intentional about answering those calls answering those texts making those dinner plans um because they're the people i love and they make me feel really good yeah, I, I would echo that being around friends that I know I can be completely myself is, is really huge. You know, even before I became an elected official, it was always hard for me to let my guard down. And so those people have become even more critical now that I am an elected official in a small town where people, where I went to the bank today and the two people in line behind me were people who knew me, right? I can't go anywhere in Palm Springs without running into somebody I know. So when I have those opportunities to be with my friends who I can do and say whatever, and I'm not worried about them judging me or I'm not worried about them teasing me about it later, it's all love. Those are the, the best. But I also have two cats and I really love them. <laughs> and they are the cutest and sweetest and softest. And when I get home, they just like love up on me and it's, the very best thing and completely melts away the stress that I have. <laughs> yeah, it's like a, a cat thing. <laughs> I just had my son. I had my son. Um, so last last uh, question is um, you can either choose to, to make a quick closing remark or what advice would you give your younger self? We'll start with Grace. I'm not sure if I have advice for myself, uh, but I, I will say um, I really hope that there are people in this room who are interested in running for office and that you take the steps to do so. I think it's an incredibly rewarding job. Uh, I have not regretted it, not even once. Uh, even even right now, as I'm campaigning for re-election, it's, and it's hard, campaigns are hard. I still know that at the end, I get to be a voice for my community. And that is just the most amazing feeling and something that I don't take for granted. And I'm, I'm very humbled to be in this position. And so I hope that some of you are thinking about it and that you'll, you'll join us because we need, um, you know, we need more good people in public office. We need more women. We need more non-binary people. We really just need more representation for all of the different communities that we have here in our in our country. Well for myself two things came to mind. The first is a quote which is by Maya Angelou which I share often when I speak 
which is people may forget what you said, they will forget what you did, but they will never forget the way that you made them feel. LA is in pain. Our, all of the surrounding communities are in pain because of how people have been made to feel with recent remarks and comments and statements that were completely inappropriate, atrocious, racist to go on. So remember how you're making people feel when you're doing this work. Show up with intention. If you decide to show up in this space, if you're going to pull up a seat at the table, you better be prepared to be there for every single person who you're advocating for. And that does not exclude anybody. And so remember how you make people feel. Care about people. Tell the people that you love that you love them. Tell the people who inspire you that you are inspired by them. Tell the people who you believe in that you believe in them. Because you never know who's hearing it and needs to hear it. And sometimes those people are going to come back and tell you what you need to hear as well. And so I want to just leave and end on, I hope that you consider to show up in the ways in the world that you dream of showing up. And whoever needs to hear it in this room, I'm going to say it one more time. You are no longer allowed to play small. That's so beautiful. I think, you know, back to where I was when I was in college and I was just so, so um, in a hurry to graduate and get that degree. And, you know, as a first generation student, you know, I didn't know exactly where I was going to go with it, but I knew I needed that degree and I wanted to show it and make my family proud. But in the process, I didn't really bother to, to try and discover me and where my interests were. And so I found myself graduating from university kind of feeling a little lost. Sure, I studied political science, but how did I put that into practice? And so what I would tell myself, my younger me, it would be to slow down a little bit in college, one, try to enjoy some of it. <laughs> um, but more than anything, to pursue something that maybe I was interested in and not just the pursuit of the degree, right? Because the other thing that, um, that is unfortunate, um, as first-generation students, a lot of, or at least for me, my networks, you know, my parents were working class. My dad would tell me, Yo trabajo con la espalda para que trabajes con la cabeza. I work with my back so that you can work with your head. But everyone in my networks was a laborer, right? So I couldn't, I didn't count on a mentor to bring me up. So what I would tell myself if I could go back in time would be to slow down a little bit, explore something that interests me and try to find myself that mentor to, you know, to, to transition into the professional world. And with that, I ask, and, and Denise walking up, I ask you to please um, help me in thanking our esteemed panel of local Latina elected leaders. Thank you. <laughs>